as we can assume that viewers will be more interested in some of the other stories from this month, we'll keep the COVID-19 update brief. Here are the current confirmed cases and deaths as of the last day of editing, with the world unfortunately hitting the 6 million deaths Xbox Live achievement. Countries currently experiencing a recent spike in cases include the United States, Russia, the United Kingdom, South Korea, and Japan. This month also saw a shiny new COVID variant drop, the BA2 sub-variant of the Omicron strain. Not much is currently known about this new variation as of yet, however, it seems to be even more infectious than vanilla Omicron. It is also uncertain whether this new strain is resistant to existing vaccines, but that's half the fun when it comes to the ever-evolving COVID-19 meta. In a span of just over two weeks, the Winter Olympics came and went, seeing nearly 3,000 athletes from 91 countries traveling to Beijing to compete. In terms of the overall medal count, Norway came out on the top of the podium, followed closely by Germany in second, China in third, the United States in fourth, then Sweden, in a very respectable fifth place position. As you might imagine, such a high profile event, taking place in China of all places, was bound to strike some controversy, and I likely suspect that internet historian himself is rubbing his hands together, just watching it all unfold. Let's start with the city selection process. Before the selection was made in 2015, there were six main candidates for the host city, Krakow Poland, Lviv Ukraine, Stockholm Sweden, Oslo Norway, Almaty Kazakhstan, and Beijing China. The problem is that although hosting the Olympics can bring prestige, a boost in the local economy, and a sense of national pride, the games have also proved to be notoriously expensive. No Olympic Games have run under budget in the past 60 years, and the shiny new stadiums and venues built for the events very often fall into disrepair after the Games have concluded. This isn't even mentioning the residents of the host cities, who are often very much inconvenienced by the Games. In fact, when Beijing hosted the Summer Olympics in 2008, an estimated 1.5 million people were evicted from their homes, with minimal compensation, and in the 2016 Olympics in Brazil, residents were forcibly removed with rubber bullets. With this in mind, both Poland and Sweden would later withdraw their bid after receiving lackluster public support, while Ukraine would be forced to withdraw on account of fighting a war with Russian mercenaries, a problem that has still persisted to this day. The three remaining candidates were China, Kazakhstan, and Norway, the latter of which was long favored to be the best option. In fact, after measuring 14 metrics from all three cities, Norway was only beaten in three categories. Perhaps not all that surprising, considering the results from our country tier list, which we released earlier in the month. Ultimately, public support in Norway was shattered by a few particularly laughable demands by the International Olympic Committee, and before we start, let it be known that I fucking swear I'm not making this up. The Olympic Committee wanted special lanes on the road to be used exclusively for committee members, a cocktail reception at the Royal Palace, with drinks paid for by the Royal Family, and perhaps the most insane of all, exclusive control over all advertising space throughout the city of Oslo, which needed to be rejected on account of Norway being a liberal democracy. Norway dropped that shit and never looked back, leaving just two candidates left in the running. Although Beijing performed better in nearly every single metric, the city of Almaty certainly put up a good fight, as the final vote was 40 to 44, in favor of China. Of course, since winning the bid seven years ago, the world has undoubtedly changed, and China's reputation among the world stage has certainly seen better days. In less than a decade, China has managed to piss off a lot of specific groups. The people of Taiwan are angry on account of China claiming sovereignty over the region. The people of Hong Kong are angry on account of China claiming sovereignty over the region. And the people of Tibet, as you could probably guess, are also angry that China has claimed sovereignty over the region. This is of course oversimplifying many of these disputes, but if we wanted to break down all the places China thinks it owns, we'd be here all fucking day. As far as I'm concerned, China can claim sovereignty over these nuts. This isn't even mentioning China's systematic genocide of the nation's ethnic Uyghur population in the northwest region of the country, which has so far led to the detention of over a million people. 
the treatment of Uyghurs in the country has been called the largest scale detention of ethnic and religious minorities since the Second World War, and those detained are very frequently sterilized and subject to forced labor. In the interest of time, we won't delve into it any further, but the Chinese government has long been known for collecting all the infinity stones of human rights abuses. As you might imagine, there's long been calls to boycott the games outright, however, it seems as if many human rights groups have settled on a compromise. This comes in the form of a diplomatic boycott, which still allows athletes to compete, but stops any high-ranking officials from attending the games. Ten nations have decided to impose diplomatic boycotts for the aforementioned reasons, but the fun doesn't stop there. The athletes themselves began complaining about their accommodation, with some not having access to training equipment, while others had suggested that their food was all but inedible. One German coach stated that they only had access to chips, nuts, and chocolate. A Russian athlete was served the same thing, three meals a day, while the United States expected such problems and brought their own food from home. Things took a turn for the worse when the living quarters of Team Finland began leaking from the ceiling, and although it was initially reported that Chinese officials had attempted to cover up these images of Water World, we couldn't find any evidence to support these claims. Many of the athletes also complained about a lack of internet access, while the United States, Dutch, British, Australian, and Canadian Olympic committees recommended the athletes bring burner phones to stop their information getting stolen, as the mandatory COVID monitoring app was deemed to be vulnerable to data breaches. As you might imagine, the app also censored certain words and phrases, most notably, anything related to the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre. The torch relay itself also came under fire, as one of the bearers was an army commander who participated in the skirmishes between China and India as recently as last year, and as a result, India joined a diplomatic boycott of the games. Perhaps most laughable of all is that a Uyghur athlete was chosen to help deliver the Olympic flame, which seemed to be the equivalent of a person saying they are not racist because they have a black friend. There was also the issue of Beijing's climate, which isn't exactly ideal for outdoor winter sports, and in some cases, snow needed to be transported from other regions for the events to go forward. The venue choice was once again called into question when it was discovered that the ski jump venue was in the middle of an industrial region of the city, and more specifically, inside an abandoned steel mill. This is the kind of shit that happens right after you activate the money cheat on The Sims. There were also 8 separate events, which were criticized for having questionable adjudication. However, as none of us are Olympic level experts on any of these events, we are happy to leave that to the people who actually know their shit. The 2022 Olympics are over, and the fire festival organizers are once again out of work, but here's hoping that Italy can do a better job in 2026. With this in mind, when all they need to do is not attempt a systematic genocide of an entire culture to come out ahead, our Italian friends should be just fine. One event which started a bit too late for us to cover last month was the Canadian trucker convoy, so let's dive into this drawn out protest and how it came to be, as it stands. To enter both the United States and Canada, a person must either be fully vaccinated or be quarantined for 14 days upon arrival. Up until the end of last year however, both nations had given an exemption to truck drivers in an effort to ease supply chain disruptions that have proven to be a detriment since the start of the pandemic. This exemption was then revoked by both Canada and the United States around the middle of January, meaning all truckers crossing the border now had to either show proof of vaccination or be forced to quarantine for two weeks, the latter of which as you might imagine would make it particularly difficult to meet their strict deadlines. What followed was an organized protest of truckers within Canada, involving hundreds of trucks and thousands of protesters who formed convoys in several cities around Canada, with the largest converging in the nation's capital of Ottawa. The protest, at least initially, was against vaccination mandates, but soon morphed into a rally opposing COVID-19 restrictions as a whole. Truck drivers would end up blocking entire roads, some of which served as vital logistical choke points for the flow of goods between the United States and Canada. After all, truck drivers more than anyone 
would know how to make such a demonstration hurt, and some estimates predicted the disruption was costing around 800 million Canadian dollars a day in Ottawa alone. This cost was not only factoring the loss of trade, but also due to surrounding business being impacted, as well as the huge influx of police required to not only keep an eye on the convoy, but also the counter-protests that started forming against the truckers, who would make headlines for their particularly unique form of demonstration. There was also the threat of a handful of more extreme individuals who were linked to groups such as QAnon or a number of white supremacist movements, and although there were indeed clashes with police and a colorful mix of people with very questionable beliefs, it's not exactly fair to judge an entire classroom by that one kid who eats glue. In any case, the Canadian Prime Minister's security team would deem the rally a potential security risk and opted to move Prime Minister Trudeau to an undisclosed location. With that being said, the convoy participants didn't necessarily reflect the beliefs of truckers as a whole, as when the protests began, approximately 85% of licensed truck drivers in Canada had already been fully vaccinated. Opinion polls were also conducted among the wider population, and although results vary depending on the sample group, on average, around 30% of Canadians had support for the protesters, while 70% were largely in favor of vaccination mandates. Perhaps one of the most impressive aspects of the convoy was how effectively they managed to generate funding. A GoFundMe campaign was able to raise a staggering $10 million, with the help of 120,000 donors. This campaign would later be shut down by GoFundMe itself after it was informed by Canadian authorities that the funds may be used to promote extremism. One million of the funds would eventually be paid out to the organizers after they had provided a proper distribution plan for that portion, while GoFundMe would announce that the remaining nine million would be given to a list of approved charities. As you can imagine, the 130,000 people were understandably pissed off that the company would give away 90% of the money raised, so after steep backlash, GoFundMe opted instead to streamline its refund process. A second fundraiser would soon be started on a platform called Give Send Go, which raised over 8 million US dollars less than a week after the first fundraiser was shut down. The site was later hacked, revealing that over half the donors were US citizens. Due to the nature of the protests, Canadian authorities struggled to know how exactly to deal with hundreds of enormous and well-funded trucks camped out in the middle of the road. To use a game in comparison, the whole situation was like the Overwatch GOATS meta, which made half the hero roster irrelevant overnight. One solution was to confiscate the protesters' fuel, as they would no longer be able to keep their truck cabins powered and have to endure the harsh Canadian winter without heat. As you might imagine, this would also prevent the truckers from leaving at all, which proved to be no good. Another solution was to simply tow the trucks away, but this also came into its own set of problems. Firstly, as you might imagine, Many tow truck drivers were sympathetic with the protesters, who worked essentially the same jobs, and as a result, were unwilling to accept the work. The second problem was the potential cost, as many of the tow trucks used could cost anywhere between $300,000 to $1 million, and should a hostile situation break out, these owners could potentially lose out on a lot of money. The third problem was to do with logistics. These trucks are some big motherfuckers, and even with a cooperative driver, just pripping a truck to have it ready to tow takes around an hour. However, if a truck driver is unwilling to cooperate, this could add another half an hour to the process, which could well extend to another 10 hours if they decided to lay down in front of the truck. Considering the thousands of protesters could just take turns indefinitely, this could also turn into an exercise in futility. By the middle of February, three weeks into the protest, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, now out of options, evoked the 1988 Emergencies Act, which marked the first time in the nation's history that this particular law was put into effect. In short, the law was designed to be used in times of national crisis and grants the Prime Minister extraordinary powers for a 30-day period, including the power to prohibit public assembly. After this point, the Canadian government made it abundantly clear that they weren't fucking around. Participants of the protest who refused to disperse could now have their trucks seized, their insurance suspended, and their bank accounts frozen. 
For the first time since the protest began, the Canadian police force greatly outnumbered the protesters, allowing them to much more easily make arrests and forcibly remove demonstrators if they saw fit to do so. I suspect that more than any other story we cover this month, the Canadian convoy is going to be the subject of debate, as there are so many factors to consider in the large scheme of things. Supporters of the protest would point to its formidable financial backing, their right to protest a law they felt deeply about, and the subsequent international demonstrations, which would emerge in solidarity. In every large-scale protest, there's inevitably going to be violent or unsavory characters, but the vast majority of those participating were only concerned with what they felt was government overreach. Those against the demonstrators can also be understood as many see a vaccine mandate for citizens traveling between countries to be a reasonable request in the interest of public health. Citizens who aren't vaccinated against COVID-19 take up a disproportionate number of hospital beds, and when this could potentially risk the lives of non-COVID patients, many of those against the protesters have criticized those involved as short-sighted or outright selfish. There are also other parties that have their own views on the movement. The Canadian Civil Liberties Association heavily criticized the use of the Emergencies Act to quell demonstrations, stating that the legal standard for its use had not been met. Local business owners and residents on the other hand were often not so supportive of the truckers as the blocking of roads, the suspension of business, and the disruption of supply chains hasn't made them all too popular among those within the area. This isn't even considering the several lawsuits issued by residents for noise complaints and the outspoken opposition from healthcare workers, which I suspect I don't need to explain. As it currently stands, the Canadian trucker protest is already more than three times longer than the average story we cover on this series, and although we could likely break down the opinions of every man and their dog who might have a horse in this race, it's probably just better to leave things how they are and let viewers make up their own mind. Like everything we cover, a link to our list of sources is in the description. The annual democracy report from The Economist was released this month, which looks at 60 different metrics over 5 different categories in order to rank countries by their democratic outcomes. According to the report, the most democratic country on earth was unsurprisingly Norway, followed by New Zealand, Finland, Sweden, Iceland, Denmark, Ireland, Taiwan, and then Switzerland and Australia, in a shared 9th place position. Although North Korea has been the reigning champion for being the least democratic country on earth, it was actually beaten by two other nations this year, and long-time viewers could probably guess which ones take the title. In second to last place we have Myanmar, which has now been under military rule for the past year, and when you consider that the government is literally airstriking citizens, you could probably imagine its democratic institutions aren't holding up all that well. In very last place, as you've probably guessed, is Afghanistan, which dropped a whopping 28 places after it was officially taken over by the Taliban in August last year, when one of the first things they did was ban women from the Ministry of Women, you can be sure they probably don't give a shit about citizens having a say over their own lives. In general, Eastern Europe was one of the biggest winners this year, with three whole countries moving their way up to the title of flawed democracies, while South America saw a particularly bad year as it suffered the greatest fall of a single region since the start of the index in 2006. This decline was attributed to citizens losing confidence in democratic institutions during the COVID-19 pandemic and a shift toward a populist strongman meta in the region. As you might imagine, Africa also didn't perform all that well, which is partly attributed to jihadist groups destabilizing the region and the fact that it can't seem to go 5 fucking minutes without someone attempting a military coup. Of course, as around 60% of viewers for this channel come from just 5 countries, we might as well mention them as well. At number 5 is Germany, which ranks 15th in the world, qualifying the country as a full democracy. The nation has however slipped from 14th place, so they should probably keep an eye on things before any out of work painters get any fucking ideas. At number 4 is Australia, which fortunately gets to remain in the top 10. 
Although Australian citizens by law are required to vote in federal elections, the nation's lowest score was somehow given to political participation, which tells you all you need to know about the country. At number 3, we have Canada, which at 12th place also qualifies the nation as a full democracy. With this in mind, the country received its lowest score since 2006, and analysts suggest that the nation might be mirroring a trend in the United States, in which citizens have slowly lost trust in both political parties and government institutions. The second most amount of viewers come from the United Kingdom, which they'll be happy to know, has been ranked higher than France. Although still considered a full democracy, the United Kingdom is mighty close to dropping below this threshold, meaning there really isn't much breathing room to drop any lower. Lastly, roughly 40% of our viewership is in the United States, which we can proudly say only dropped one place in the past year. The United States hasn't been considered a full democracy since 2015, and has long been held back in both the metrics of political culture and the functioning of government. What makes this particularly damning is that even if you somehow moved the United States to South America, the Middle East, or Africa, it still wouldn't be the highest rated democracy within these regions. Overall, democracy around the world has seen another year-on-year -year decrease, which has mostly been attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, with vaccination rates steadily increasing, and with nations slowly easing restrictions, time will only tell if these stats will return to pre-pandemic levels or keep drifting ever so slightly lower. If you're trying to remain invisible online or just trying to watch region-locked content, then you'll probably want a VPN. Surfshark VPN makes protecting your online privacy and watching prohibited Netflix shows easier than not going to war with Ukraine, and you can rest easy knowing that your privacy will be infinitely more secure than the Crimean Peninsula. Gone are the days of having to watch Surf Sub 2, featuring John Cena and The Undertaker, on a site which looks 15 years old. Simply change your location to anywhere you like and appreciate a whole cornucopia of new media to enjoy. Signing up with the code on screen will give viewers an 83% discount, 3 months for free, and viewers who aren't 100% satisfied can back out in the first 30 days and get a full refund. Surfshark VPN, it's cheaper than the other ones. Meanwhile, European leaders embrace Facebook's threat of the platform pulling out of the continent. One American hacker took down all of North Korea's internet and Wikipedia editors stand by to be the fastest in the West. In the tech world, February proved to be a particularly rough month for Facebook as Apple decided to announce new changes to its privacy features. Without boring anyone with the details, Apple has decided to disallow apps from using a unique ID to track a user's data across multiple applications. These IDs contain information about a user's search history, their purchases, and ties to any accounts they might be signed into, which allows these apps to generate custom targeted ads depending on the user profile. In other words, Facebook's entire business model of targeted advertising will no longer work on any Apple devices. Additionally, Google also announced similar changes, but focused on developing an alternative method for tracking data that doesn't interfere with user privacy. This subtle distinction is important, largely because Google is not only in the same business as Facebook, but also acts as a middleman from which the data is recorded. Such a change would prove to have a dramatic impact on Facebook's bottom line, when in an investor call, the company would announce that Apple's new policy would cost an estimated $10 billion this year alone. Adding to this bad news, Facebook would also announce its first net loss in users for the first time in its 20-year history, losing around half a million over the last three months. Lizard Zuckerberg detailed that the rise in competing platforms such as TikTok has been a huge contributing factor to the platform's downfall, and that Facebook has found it particularly difficult to monetize short-form videos. After the investor call, Facebook's stock price would drop a staggering 26%, losing over $250 billion in value overnight. The most surprising part of this whole ordeal is that even after invading Ukraine and wiping a third of all value in a single day, the entire Russian stock market actually lost less money than Facebook this month. 
Of course, it's not fair to compare the two, as one is led by a supervillain, determined to use disinformation to slowly chip away at the very fabric of democracy, and the other is currently invading Ukraine. If there's one place in the world that doesn't take breaches in privacy well, it's the sunny state of Texas, and these yeehaw motherfuckers are out for blood. Due to Facebook collecting facial recognition data of both users and non-users alike, the state of Texas has decided to sue the company for illegally harvesting these photos without their consent. A similar lawsuit was filed in the state of Illinois in November last year, which led to the company stating that this feature is no longer operational. However, Texas argues that by the time Facebook had stopped, it had already violated both its biometric data and consumer privacy laws billions of times. To make matters even more terrifying for Facebook's investors, Texas is requesting between 10 to $25,000 for each violation, which according to Jake the Analyst, when considering the population of Texas, means Facebook would face a fine of over $1.1 trillion, which would be enough to run the entire US military for nearly a year and a half. It's no secret that a career in journalism isn't always the safest occupation, as any journalist worth their salt will be pissing off a lot of powerful people. Journalists provide a crucial role in society by exposing corruption, keeping government officials honest, and reporting on some of the biggest injustices that might otherwise go unspoken. At the end of last year, Reporters Without Borders released their annual report, which found that more than any country in the world, Mexico was the most dangerous nation for the profession. Perhaps not content with being the best there ever was, by the fifth week of this year, Mexico had already seen five journalists murdered, which is fucking insane, when considering it had the gold place position last year, with a body count of just seven. If Mexico kept up this rate, they'd beat last year's worldwide figures just by themselves, in around half the time. Following this violent streak of killings, protests formed across the country over the months of January and February, following a sentiment that not enough is being done to protect journalists from these attacks, which are very often from organized crime groups across the country. In truth, there is something of a government-funded form of protection for such individuals, which provide services such as home surveillance systems, all the way up to personal bodyguards. However, the roughly 500 members of this program have been skeptical of its effectiveness. Out of the five journalists killed in the first five weeks of the year, four were not under the protection of this program, and according to a representative of the Committee to Protect Journalists, very often it's impossible to stop an assassination attempt, even under direct police protection. Very often, it's customary for journalists, police, or government officials to be presented an offer of lead or silver by members of a cartel, meaning you can neither accept bribes to turn a blind eye to criminal activity or face the risk of being killed for not cooperating. On top of this, around 98% of crimes, including murders, go unsolved in Mexico, and when you consider that there's such an incentive to keep your mouth shut, this isn't exactly surprising. The Mexican president isn't exactly helping either, even gaining a reputation of being openly hostile to those within the industry, calling them quote, thugs, mercenaries, and sellouts. President Lopez Obrador even outdid himself this month, going on a 30-minute rant at his daily press briefing against journalists who criticized him. The lion's share of the rant was directed at one journalist in particular, who had exposed that his adult son was living in a luxury home in Houston, Texas, owned by an oil executive, who landed contracts with Mexico's state-owned oil company. It's unlikely that the working conditions for journalists in Mexico will get any better, but when they can't even trust their own elected leader to be on their side, let alone provide adequate protection against targeted killings, such a depressing cycle of violence is an unfortunate inevitability. A story we decided not to cover last month was the Russian troop buildup at the Ukrainian border, because as regular viewers of the channel might know, Russia had already done that shit twice, last year alone. Due to the ever-changing nature of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we purposely finalized the script as late as possible, however, with this fast timeline, 
and a bombard of propaganda to sift through, there's still a lot we don't know. To give context for the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we'll have to wind the clock back, almost 8 years exactly. In February 2014, protests against the pro-Russian president of Ukraine would eventually lead to a revolution, which would spring an entirely new government within the country. As Russia didn't recognize this new government and considered the volatile country as being a threat to Russians within the nation, Vladimir Putin invaded the eastern regions of Donetsk and Luhansk, as well as yoinking the Crimean Peninsula. Ever since, these regions have been under the control of Russian-backed mercenaries, which although gave them a thinly veiled cover of deniability, really wasn't fooling anyone. The majority of what Russia does is absolute bullshit, however, Vladimir Putin's claim over the Crimean Peninsula can at least be put into a grey area. Although not recognized internationally as Russian territory, the majority of the Crimean population consider themselves Russian and speak the Russian language, which certainly can't be said for the rest of Ukraine. Since 2014, over 10,000 people have died in skirmishes between Ukraine and these Russian-backed separatists. On the other hand, the Donetsk and Luhansk regions had held referendums, which officially saw citizens overwhelmingly vote in favor of becoming part of Russia, but the process itself was about as dodgy as your local NFT dealer. The referendum had exactly no international observers, no up-to-date electoral lists, the ballot papers were photocopies, and the entire process was overseen by very scary Russian men, armed with very scary automatic weapons. In fact, a person fucking died in one town, which tells you just how legitimate the process must have been. Since 2014, Ukraine has become much more aligned with the rest of Europe and other democratically minded states. This has been seen as a threat to Russia, as Ukraine houses the biggest population of Russians outside of the motherland, and should Ukraine officially become a member of NATO, this would destroy any hope of getting the Soviet Union band back together. On the 20th of February, the Russian parliament voted to recognize the independent states of Donetsk and Luhansk. Two days later, Vladimir Putin ordered Russian troops into these regions, which it now recognizes as part of Russia, but they had no intention of stopping at these borders. Although it's quite clear that the purpose of the invasion is to take over the nation of Ukraine and either absorb it into Russia or install a pro-Russian puppet into power, the justification for the invasion is an entire topic in and of itself. Before the invasion, Russian separatists shelled the town of Stanitsa Luhanska, wounding two teachers and cutting off power to half the town. According to Russian state-controlled media, this attack was orchestrated by Ukrainian forces. However, nearly every other intelligence service with two brain cells to rub together called this claim bullshit almost immediately. The attack is known as a false flag operation, where one group stages an attack disguised as another group, often to justify an escalation of their choosing. As we are all gamers here, viewers might remember the No Russian mission in Modern Warfare 2, where Russian extremists shoot up the Moscow airport in order to justify a war with the United States. The title of the mission, No Russian, is a reference to the attack, being a false flag operation. Although not nearly as extreme, Vladimir Putin sure as shit tries to sell it that way, even going as far as falsely accusing Ukraine of a genocide in the east of the country and handing out around 700,000 Russian passports so their actions could be justified as protecting Russian citizens. Mr. Putin also went as far as accusing Ukrainian society of having become pro-Nazi, however, this claim quickly falls apart under even the slightest bit of scrutiny. From what we could find, rates of neo-Nazi behavior in Ukraine and Russia are quite similar, and even though there is indeed a group within Ukraine with around 10,000 members, this doesn't exactly reflect the nation's 44 million people. In fact, Ukraine is the only country outside of Israel with both a Jewish head of state and a Jewish head of government, with President Zelensky's grandfather actually serving in the Soviet army to fight against Nazis and losing three family members to the Holocaust. Ultimately, Vladimir Putin could have just accused President Zelensky of shitting in his cornflakes and saved us all the trouble of listening to his bullshit excuses to invade. 
the invasion itself started on the 24th of February with Russian forces attacking from occupied Crimea in the south, the Donbass region in the east, and the Russian puppet state of Belarus from the north, which viewers might recognize as being run by Harry Potter's uncle, who rigged the nation's elections after he was about to lose to a YouTuber. This truly is a strange time to be alive. Almost immediately, Russia struck as many key military installations as they could, including weapons depots, airfields, and command centers. President Zelensky would then declare martial law and immediately sever diplomatic relations with Russia. Fighting would break out all across the country, with at least 100,000 civilians already having evacuated, many being accepted as refugees, into Moldova and Romania. During the opening day of the invasion, Thousands of war stories were written for the ages, but perhaps the most famous was the invasion of Snake Island, a tiny piece of land just 35 kilometers from mainland Ukraine. At around 6 in the evening, Ukrainian border guards posted on the island were approached by two Russian Navy ships and ordered to surrender. The official response to the request was quote, Russian warship, go fuck yourself, which might just be the most acute case of big dick energy recorded in the last decade. The Russian warships would ultimately open fire, wiping out all 13 of the island's occupants, who would then all be posthumously awarded with the title of Hero of Ukraine, the highest military honor in the country. Russian defense media would later claim that the island was occupied by 82 Ukrainian soldiers, who all surrendered voluntarily. By the end of the first day, 137 Ukrainian soldiers and civilians were declared dead. President Zelensky ordered a general mobilization for all males aged 18 to 60, and Russian forces had taken control over the Chernobyl nuclear power plant for old time's sake. On day two, Russian forces had entered the district of Obolon, in the nation's capital of Kiev, less than 10 kilometers from the Ukrainian parliament. By this time, the Ukrainian Minister of Defense announced that all citizens, regardless of age, were eligible to volunteer for military service. President Zelensky asked residents of the capital to prepare Molotov cocktails for the imminent arrival of Russian troops, as well as hand out 18,000 guns to residents who wanted to fight. By this time, it was expected that Russia would already have air superiority over Ukrainian airspace. However, it appeared Ukraine's air defenses were intact, if not degraded. US intelligence announced that Russian troops had not advanced as quickly as either they or Vladimir Putin would have expected, however, warned that Russia had only used around 30% of its overall massed troops for the invasion. By day 3, a Ukrainian fighter jet shot down a Russian transport plane south of Kiev, ending another day where Russia had unexpectedly failed to gain air superiority. Russian forces successfully took the southern port city of Berdyansk, however, its northern invasion force was less successful, suffering logistical issues, which stalled the advance of tanks and other armored vehicles. Meanwhile, despite offers from the United States to have him evacuated, President Zelensky stated quote, the fight is here, I need ammunition, not a ride. U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, would make an announcement the same day, declaring that 350 million in weapons, ammunition, and various military equipment had been authorized to be sent to Ukrainian forces. The international response to the invasion has been overwhelmingly negative, and excluding a few authoritarian states such as Belarus, Iran, Venezuela, North Korea, and Syria, there wasn't much love for Russia. China on the other hand seemed to be mostly indifferent to the invasion, while the Taliban called for peace between the two sides. At the same time, NATO-aligned countries were busy charging up a collective spirit bomb of coordinated sanctions. The European Union declared it would be imposing the harshest package of sanctions it had ever put into practice, while the United States piled on with its own targeted sanctions to both banks, as well as powerful Russian billionaires, close to President Putin. The United States also instituted export controls, which would restrict Russian access to high-tech hardware and software, of which any part was developed within the United States. Not only does this make it extremely hard to fix security vulnerabilities, but eventually it will make it near impossible to replace military hardware, forcing Russia to rely on its current stockpile. 
The United Kingdom also joined in on the sanctions, excluding Russian banks from the UK financial system and freezing the assets of around 100 key individuals and entities. Other nations such as Australia, Japan, and Canada have all enacted various degrees of sanctions, while Germany has halted certification of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, a huge piece of infrastructure designed to transport Russian gas to heat an estimated 26 million German homes. On 27 February, Ukrainian allies decided to block Russia's access to the global financial system by banning Russian banks from accessing the SWIFT payment infrastructure. What this essentially means is although Russia will still be able to make transactions, it makes it much more complicated and expensive to do so, making it severely difficult to import or export anything within the country. This, combined with the Russian ruble hitting an all-time low shortly after the invasion, certainly doesn't place the country in a comfortable position. The reason as to why exactly Vladimir Putin would decide to invade has been a matter of debate, but according to Mark Galliati, an expert on Russian security affairs, it might be as simple as a matter of pride. Mr. Galliati said quote, it's not about Russia, it's about Putin and this small circle of people around him who dominate this country. This is a view of a bunch of old men who can't quite get over the fact that they are no longer running a superpower. In many ways, there might be truth to this statement. Russia's influence on the world stage has significantly shrunk since the fall of the Soviet Union over 30 years ago. The empire was broken into 15 separate states, and Western influence has reached the doorsteps of even Russia's closest neighbors. Russia's economic situation is also laughable when compared to similar-sized nations, with the US states of California. Texas, and New York, all individually having larger economies than the entirety of Russia. At this stage, I think it's appropriate to compare Putin to the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky. Unlike most world leaders, Mr. Zelensky didn't start a career in politics, rather, he finished his law degree before starting a career in comedy. Fast forward to 2015, and Zelensky would star in the television series, Servant of the People, where he played a high school history teacher, who would go on to become the president of Ukraine, after his anti-corruption classroom rant, went viral. The production company then decided to create a political party named after the show, and after just a four-month political campaign in 2019, Vladimir Zelensky would become the president of Ukraine, with a staggering 73% of the vote. By the time Russia invaded, Zelensky's refusal to leave the capital effectively ended Vladimir Putin's reputation overnight, as no amount of photo ops of the Russian leader fishing, riding on horseback, or attending judo tournaments could possibly be as chat-like as standing steadfast in the face of a much larger invading force. If the invasion of Ukraine really was a project to prop up Putin's legacy, it seems Vladimir Zelensky is about to become everything Putin's carefully curated propaganda wishes he could be. Support for the invasion within Russia is difficult to properly determine, as although there were protests in 51 cities across the country, the nation's tightly controlled media isn't exactly a good representation of the general attitude of the Russian people. What we can do however, is see exactly what kind of coverage the invasion is getting in Russian media, as the Russian state-controlled news network, RT, is available on YouTube, for anyone to watch and enjoy. It took us around 10 seconds to find a video which is entirely propaganda and is complete with a comment section filled with Russian bots to spread support for the invasion. We'd like to make the point that so far 100% of our news coverage this year has been age restricted, which doesn't appear to be a problem for a channel openly supporting Vladimir Putin's invasion. It's very likely that events have continued to unfold in dramatic and unexpected ways in the short space between writing and editing this portion of the video. However, we expect this will become a regular segment for the series long into the foreseeable future. With this month of news over, we'd like to thank our growing list of Patreon supporters for sticking around for so long. With YouTube the way it is, having the luxury of being able to say whatever the fuck we want is obviously a huge benefit for a series attempting to tackle some seriously dark topics. On top of this, it also lets us start more ambitious projects that might take an upward of 6 months. 
to reach the light of day, something that would otherwise be impossible if we were left entirely to the mercy of YouTube. As of time of writing, we are only 3 more Patreon supporters from our next stretch goal, which is as exciting as it is terrifying. If we manage to hit this milestone by this time next month, we'll release a completely open poll where viewers can vote on literally any video idea they could imagine. This could range from a review of a specific game, the comprehensive history of Mediterranean cheeses, or a tier list of the best mid-price door knobs. We honestly don't give a shit. It's ultimately just a fun way to thank everyone for supporting the channel and being the best bunch of wholesome degenerates we could ever hope to have the privilege of entertaining. As always, links to support us, follow any members of the team, or browse our list of sources is down below. And on behalf of everyone, I'd like to wish all viewers a happy March of 2022.